Hello fellow crafters, this is Lon Vader and I'm back for a new tutorial. I know it's been a long time. I haven't exactly been idle for two months. Uh, I just had a lot of work, uh, a lot of work related stuff. And uh, also for some of you guys who follow me on Twitter or on the live streams, uh, I've been experimenting with stop motion, trying to build a stop motion puppet for quite some time. And I finally uh, finished uh, building it. Uh, it works. I used used it in uh, in animation, uh, and I'm gonna work with it uh, more from now on. Uh, and I've pretty much filmed, uh, documented the whole uh, endeavor. So I must have had some like 250 gigabytes of footage, and I've edited all of this uh, into one big tutorial to show you guys how I did because uh, I had many tryouts and things didn't work out, and I find new ways. I used many uh, videos from actual animators that put on some content on YouTube. So I'll put all the links in the descriptions. The videos, very interesting videos that I used to design the puppet or that I'm going to use to design other puppets. So there you go. I hope this is going to be interesting. And I'm basically going to show you guys how to build, uh, how I built uh, him. This is Bjorn. Um, Bjorn minus an eyebrow because he lost one of the eyebrows that were man magnetic and it fell somewhere so I think I'm going to do some spares. But there you go, uh, pretty well made uh, stop motion animation uh, for um, amateur um, uh, work. Pretty happy with the result, it works pretty well, the faces, uh, the mouth are removable for other expression, facial expressions and, and mouth uh, shapes. Uh, and uh, yeah, I hope uh, this uh, this tutorial will be interesting. I'll see you at the end of the video. So Bjorn is actually a character I created many years ago. I think it was around uh, 2011. Uh, so um, I used many old drawings. I did uh, several illustrations of him. He was supposed to be a uh, part of a duo of two Vikings. So he was more of the rustic one. Uh, he was a hunter uh, living in the forest, you know, very rustic, uh, naive kind of uh, person, very adventurous. Uh, so I had some references, I knew where I was going uh, before starting the puppets. So as you can see here uh, in this sketchbook, I already made a few uh, designs, a few sketches of how the, um, the, um, the puppet was going to look. So first a uh, wire frame. Uh, then afterwards uh, some foam on top of it and probably some some very light um, cloth to uh, wrap uh, the whole thing and underneath you can see the system uh, with uh, removable heads uh, and this was inspired by the, the stop motion uh, film Kobo. So as you can see I first did a, a very fast sketch of uh, the proportions of the character and then I started to work. So at first what I used was this uh, wire so you can find uh, better suiting uh, alloys than, uh, than this iron, this kind of steel that hasn't got very good bending properties. But hey, it was my first test and I didn't have aluminum wire, I so I thought this might work. As you can see, I didn't twist the wire because I thought that would cause more breakage. I used some epoxy for the harder parts. That's something i still going to use uh, in most uh, of the tryouts I'm going to do. So the parts that aren't going to move uh, were covered by epoxy and the rest, the articulations, uh, were left uh, open with only the wire. So I used some pretty thin uh, aluminum tubing for the, the forearms. The idea was to, uh, to, to make some, some hands in case they broke because I already knew that uh, wires tend to break and especially when they were thin, like hands. So you basically had to do many versions of hands and being able to replace them. But, you know, I didn't really expect uh, the wire to break uh, that fast. And as soon as the structure of the, the puppet was done, uh, the, the wire broke at the elbow. So as you can see, I was also starting to do a head. And I used some, some FIMO paste, some, you know, sculpting paste to do this. So just, you know, the rough shapes. So then what I did was use another kind of wire. It looked very flexible. It wasn't, still wasn't aluminum. But I thought it would be good. I run some tests and it was more flexible. I did some hands too that could be removable. And so I'm gonna wrap it up with this very thin type of cloth that I came in with um, 
furniture that I bought. So I'm gonna wrap it in this cloth. Unfortunately, it broke again at the shoulder this time. So I finally found and decided to buy uh, some aluminum wire. Uh, so I took two uh, thicknesses and then I took a drill to twist them to give them more strength. But just make sure if you do this, don't twist it too much, otherwise it will break. Now this technique seems very used to strengthen uh, the, um, the wire. Of course, the more wire you put, the uh, stronger it will be at the end. Some animators uh, don't, don't twist them and just take bigger ones uh, because if you twist them, you create micro breakage. Then again, it's better to use uh, several uh, wires than just one big, usually, because if one breaks, the other one still holds. I finished the hands with some epoxy at the center and some strings all around the, uh, the fingers. Then afterwards, I just did the same steps than before. At this point, I decided to use some latex. Uh, so I used some air drying latex with some colors uh, until I got the right tone. So as you can see here, I'm using the latex directly on the puppets. I'm not sure why, but I wanted to put latex everywhere just in case I wanted to use the puppet without or with very little clothes. Uh, you're gonna see later I just changed my mind about this. Now the problem was that I was so generous with the latex that uh, the movements were a bit impaired. Uh, so I had to cut uh, some places just to make sure that the character was going to be able to be, you know, flexible enough because the latex was, you know, uh, a hindrance at some spots. So I removed a little bit of latex. Problem is that I was almost finished. I mean, some work had to be done, but it was pretty advanced when it broke again at the shoulder. I can tell you at this stage I was getting pretty annoyed. I think I've identified the problem. There was too little wire uh, length at articulations. You see, the shorter uh, length of wire uh, you have at articulations, the more pressure and breakage uh, can occur on a small surface. The wire needs a little bit of length to be able to bend properly without breaking. So I think that was my main issue. Also, I wanted to create a character that wasn't very big. Most of the times the the puppets are actually kind of big uh, in stop motion. And I wanted something small. So something small with very thin wires that uh, with two small junctions, well, breakage. And in any case, wire always ends up breaking, no matter how well it's done. So I figured if I didn't want to have a puppet that was going to break sooner or later, I was going to have to use something else than wire. That's why I use Legos, especially some ball and socket articulations. Now these were sturdy and great uh, for some types of movements, but they couldn't turn in every di directions. So I had to work, uh, you know, assembling them with, uh, with glue, with nails, and I used the Dremel just to be able to have some, you know, nice complex articulations like the shoulders or the hips. So I actually took some time to, to you know, customize the, uh, the Lego. So as you can see, I use this uh, for the spine. It can bend in two places and can turn around and the shoulders are gonna be fixed that way. So I'm gonna remove a little bit of plastic just to make sure I'm gonna be able to stick them from the side. There you go. This is how the mechanism on the foot's gonna look like. And there's just, as you can see, a space for a, a magnet on, in the front of the foot. I want some to try something magnetic. Uh, by the end, I, I use something else, a rig, to hold the character. So there you go. You can see a little bit how it's gonna look. So this is gonna be the base of the last, um, of the last puppet, the one that actually worked that I showed you before at the beginning of the video. So this is actually how it looks like uh, inside. But I'm also going to use some epoxy just to harden the different parts that aren't going to move, just to make sure everything's pretty, uh, pretty solid. Doing the arms, doing the, le the leg. And I'm gonna sculpt them just to make sure the legs or the arms are going to be able to bend farther possible just to give a natural, uh, you know, appearance. 
using my soldering iron, uh, I'm gonna melt down just the junctions of the um, plastic pieces between them because I want to make sure that uh, the structure doesn't break inside the puppet once finished. Then I'm wrapping it inside this cloth. If some parts of the anatomy are going to be larger, here you can see the hips and the butt, you can add more cloth that's going to be, you know, uh, entangled and blocked by the, the wrappings. So then what I did was use a Dremel, and as I did on the previous version, uh, I drilled I drilled inside uh, the torso and the hips uh, two holes that were going to be used uh, uh, just to jam inside uh, two aluminum tubing. You know, when you animate, sometimes the character is going to walk or jump. Well, you need a rig to hold them up. So you need something, obviously, you need some point of anchor uh, on the puppet to hold him up. What I did found later on was that it was way more logical to use a squared section tubing just to make sure that the character won't, uh, you know, rotate around an axis uh, when held by the rig. I couldn't find some. I mean, I, I swear I've been like... Because I've been in five different, uh, you know, stores. I, I did find some that they were huge. I mean, way too big for uh, stop motion at least. So um, I had to find something else. I ended up using uh, just a stronger magnet. And it worked pretty well, as you was going to see at the end. But I made a little more uh, latex. This time using a brush, I put on some, some talc, some baby powder, just to make sure the latex wouldn't stick. And then I used a sponge and put on quite a lot of latex, just to make some skin. I used what was remaining to do the forearms. Then I took the sculpt of the head that I finished and um, drew a separation where I was going to separate the face of the head from the removable swappable faces. Then I mixed the two parts uh, component uh, that is, is especially made uh, to take imprints. The idea was to use this to uh, cast different versions of the face to be uh, swappable, to be removable. As you can see, the imprint is very good. And I'm using it, pulling in some paste, some sculpting paste in it. So this was my first idea. As you are going to see, it didn't end up very well. So here you can see me using some baby powder again to, you know, to just to peel off the latex skin. And you can see me applying uh, the skin on top of uh, the puppet. This time I didn't choose to put uh, latex everywhere on the character to preserve mobility. So I just made sure to put some latex on uh, the torso, on the shoulders and the forearms. Just I made sure to put enough latex to get something the smoother possible. It ain't perfect, but I tried to do something pretty smooth. So I think for the next versions, for the next puppets I do, I'll probably pour on the latex. It's probably gonna spill out. Um, there's probably gonna be some spillage of latex, but at least I'll get something very smooth uh, for the skin. It'll be easier, I think. So this character is pretty skinny. So I just put, uh, you know, directly the latex on top of the on the skin. Uh, but, you know, if you want to make a character that is a little more, you know, with more body fat or, you know, a, I don't know, a, like a big uh, tummy uh, that you want to animate or, I don't know, some, some breasts, if it's a female character, you can always uh, use some, uh, some, some of this uh, clay, modeling clay that never hardens to put inside uh, latex skin so you can animate it. That's what I'm going to do for new uh, new puppet models. So here you can see me uncasting one of the heads. They mostly came up pretty damaged. In any case, I changed my mind afterwards and you'll see why. I... So I did many casting of the faces and then while I was doing this and they were drying, I started doing the clothes. First, start with cloth uh, for his uh, his trousers. Now, as you can see, my hands have substantially changed shape. Uh, that's because obviously it isn't me. Uh, the trousers were made by uh, my girlfriend. So you can see her here uh, starting to do the first version of the trousers because she made two versions. 
now she tried something very easy for the you know for the trousers at first but it didn't really work because uh, it wasn't designed to be worn you couldn't actually uh, uh, sit down the character couldn't sit down otherwise the trousers uh, would create this weird effect so on the second version she actually created uh, very small trousers with um, a sort of you know bellow part uh, that's gonna give more amplitude to the the movement of the of the cloth of the the actual um, clothing so here you can see me uh, doing a template for the tunic you saw afterwards so first I did it out of uh, just simple um, paper uh, then I use uh, then I use this uh, wool and I trimmed it a little bit because it was a bit too thick uh, and I used uh, the template just to get uh, the right shape. And I cut it and then I spent a pretty long time, you know, just sewing by hand. Um, and making sure I was the most precise um, possible. Now, of course, I'm not very good at this, but I tried to do my best. It was okay, I guess. So afterwards, I also did uh, the arms, and there you go. It's all right. It's a bit stiff, but it's all right. So I put it on the puppets, and then I realized that uh, it was a bit too wide, at least around the hips. So I decided to open up, and that it would be a lot better. So what I did afterwards was do uh, some props. You can see here I'm doing uh, the belt some uh, uh, very thin le leather strap the belt buckle was mostly done you know battering and aluminum wire and also some some glue i use mainly very strong glue so there you go medieval uh, belts were often uh, worn that way folded that way And I'm using a uh, lightener just to, you know, remove the small, very small parts of the um, of the leather that is torn when cutting. So there you go, not bad for a start. Also did a satchel uh, on the side, but I didn't film it, so it was pretty easy to do just using uh, some some cloth as well. But yeah, I did a little, um, little bag hanging from the left, so you can see on the end versions. Then we have to do the shoes. For the shoes, I, I used actual leather uh, that I glued uh, on, the, on the foot, on the structure of the foot, this way. There you go. And then I just needed some soles. So I glued in uh, some soles from the same uh, you know, leather straps. This leather comes from a very old uh, coat that was damaged. But I salvaged some uh, some parts of the leather that was going to be used. And they can clip on. There you go. Nice. They can bend in the mill because they, they've got wire in them. But they look pretty realistic from the outside. At least they look like shoes. Nice. So I create some leather uh, wristbands that we're gonna hide this unrealistic separation between the hands and the, the forearm. Now I'm using the Dremel and I'm, what I'm doing is actually um, widening the hole I drilled uh, underneath the head for the neck. And I'm putting in one of the Lego pieces just to make sure that the ball and socket uh, articulation works. And he's gotta have a very uh, articulated uh, neck, which is pretty important. So there you go, you can see the head on the character. Uh, using a Dremel, my Dremel and a disc, I'm gonna separate the head from the, the face from the head. Now you'll see that finally by the end I didn't use this technique and I glued it back, uh, back on together, but my first idea was to use the same system as you can find in Kubo, the animation film. I want to be able to swap uh, emotions, to swap faces each time, but I didn't foresee that that would be really difficult to cast the faces and also very difficult during animation 
uh, to change face each time and yet get something very um, stable. So as you can see here, I drilled some holes uh, inside the head just to be able to put in some beads that are going to be used to make the, the eyes. So now I'm starting other props. So as you can see, I'm using a coffee stirrer and I'm giving it the shape, roughly the shape of a blade because I want the character to have uh, his blade uh, hanging at his belt. And I'm using some cardboard to make a very simple sheath all around. It's going to be a bone sheath around his, uh, his, uh, his knife. It's actually a special knife called a six. Uh, I don't know how you say it in English. Uh, it's a Viking knife. That's pretty much a very short sword or a very huge knife. It depends on how you see it. So I'm trimming the, the handle uh, part of the, the blade and I'm gonna thread some, some beads, some very big beads, metallic beads, uh, just to make a handle and a guard and a pommel. There you go. I think it looks pretty cool. I use my soldering iron uh, just to, you know, to burn in uh, details on the scabbard. Uh, sort of pattern as if the, the bone scabbard had been, you know, uh, sculpted. Of course, I followed the, de I followed the designs uh, of, of my drawings. So now I used also some green stuff. So this two part uh, paste uh, for sculpting. Uh, miniatures and very precise stuff. I mixed them up because I wanted uh, a guard that was more approached to a sword. So as you can see a mall here, I want something that looked more like this specific kind of weaponry you found uh, in, in this Viking era. So I painted them up. I painted the blade with very dark uh, gamel. Then I painted this cupboard with uh, ivory because it's supposed to be bone. Uh, but the blade looked a little dark. So I used a lighter metallic tone that was still pretty dark just to enhance uh, and clear uh, the blade itself and the rest of the, the weapon. Now you had grooves on the on the blades, you know, a pattern of grooves that came from the, you know, the, the actual wood. I was afraid that the details would catch too much attention on animation. So I actually decided to put on more paint and to put some paint into the, the details of, uh, of this uh, coffee stirrers. Then I put on a wash, a dark wash, just to go in the recesses uh, of the scabbard. And then I put on some very light, very, very light uh, silver uh, dry brush, mainly on the edges of the blade. There you go, with a little red ribbon, Bjorn got himself a nice looking sakes. Only thing left to do is to jam it inside the belt and there you go, he's got weaponry. Now I wanted him to have hairs, right? And I wanted to be able to animate them. So my first idea was to drill some holes uh, in the head and uh, following the right angle and to jam in some, some, some wires, some double wires, on top of which I was gonna glue some actual hair. There was a slight difference. Uh, there was a slight separation between the face and the head. So I had to take care of this. So I tried to trim, but it didn't work properly. So I had to find a way. So what I did was uh, use this very flat plastic part and uh, use some, some of this paste, squatting paste, just to have a better junction between the two pieces afterwards. In the meanwhile, what I did was take uh, the beads that were going to be used to do the eyes and I spray painted them with some off-white, with some ivory. I'm not sure why I did so many eyes, but I think it was because I wasn't sure I was going to leave the eyes inside the back of the head or if there were going to be eyes, you know, individual eyes for each version of the of the face. I don't think so, but in any case, I didn't want to, uh, you know, make a mistake, so I did many of them. I put on some green to make the, the actual eyes and, you know, put on some, you know, varnish, some shiny varnish on the eyes. 
When the two parts of the face were cleared, I was able to assemble them and get something, you know, a lot more uh, precise. But I was still concerned by the fact that the face, it was really hard to get it in place properly. Then I used the airbrush and painted the head, the front and the back of the head. Of course, clogging up my hairbrush in the process. This, I swear to you, this thing clogs up every time I use it. So there you go. And then I varnished it using a little primer for miniatures. Here you can see I'm gonna use the eyes that I painted up and varnished and put them inside and then, you know, they I encase them with uh, more uh, paste. And there you go, you got eyes encased inside the face. And that's already a problem right there, you see. If I had to drill holes in every single swappable head, it would have taken ages and a precision uh, I don't have by, you know, by hand. In Kubo, the eyes remained at uh, the back uh, of the head. So when you remove the face, you just remove the mask without the eye. Just, they were just eyelids, you know, empty eyelids. Uh, the problem is with the, f the, the, the shape of the face of my character, I wasn't able to leave the, the eyes in the, the back of the head. They had to be inside of the front of the head. So here you can see uh, what it did uh, for the head when I added all the, um, all the wiring. Uh, and I've already started uh, gluing some, some, some hairs. I already foresee that it was going to be difficult to animate uh, switching heads because each time I put on a new head, you know, you know unless you use very small uh, magnets and then you have to be overly precise, which I couldn't really do on a large scale production, um, or uh, put on some bigger magnets, but then it would have been pretty difficult to have a very exact positioning of the face during animation. So I was pretty concerned about that. Now I had two issues at this point. The hairs weren't uh, flexible enough. There were way too many wires and these weren't that flexible. So it was going to be hard to animate. And also it was going to be very tedious to glue all the natural individual hairs uh, to this. So I just decided uh, to remove of these parts and I've decided also to actually remove the lower part of the jaw. So instead of doing some swappable heads, I was gonna do some swappable uh, mouths. So here you can see me gluing on uh, the, the head on top of the back of the head. I put on more uh, sculpting paste to cover up for the, all the holes and the separation I did just leaving a magnet inside of the mouth that was going to be able to, to swap uh, the lower parts of the face. And I did some, you know, some swappable expressions, swappable uh, mouth uh, out of uh, epoxy. That's how I did it. I took a metal scrap out of a tin can topper. And this is going to be the small part that is going to you know, help uh, magnetize the, the mouth. Then I use some epoxy uh, along with this, uh, you know, paper, uh, you know, used in, uh, in the kitchen. I don't know how you call this. Just to make sure it doesn't stick. So if you're using some epoxy, I really, uh, you should use some gloves. Uh, just I did it by hand because I didn't have any gloves and it was really sticky. Then later on, I used some, some water, it prevented it from sticking too much. Here you can see me sculpting the head. Using water helps, of course. So, there you go. It's gonna make sure that it's got the right shape to be set inside. There you go. So I'm sculpting with water, just to make sure that uh, the tool doesn't stick to the actual paste. There you go. Not bad. So this is just the general shape. Uh, I'm going to go over this to make some details afterwards when it's dry, as you're going to see. 
So here it's dry, I can remove it. So using this, oh, it's removed very easily. There you go. Oxy uh, dries out really hard, so there's no really uh, danger of breakage. And there you go, as you can see, it fits perfectly. So what I'm gonna do is just put a little bit of very strong glue on the magnets that is still on the, the tin, uh, the tin uh, sheet that is still on the magnet. I'm gonna glue it on this part. There should be just enough space. And I can detach it, there you go, with the magnet still on the part. And now you can put it on and remove it pretty easily. So uh, of course I used the Dremel uh, to drill in some details on these different parts. And I also used some green stuff along with water then again to sculpt, uh, just to sculpt some details. Uh, the lips, where the lips were, miss were missing or sometimes the thong. Uh, well, all the elements that were too detailed to be really sculpted out of epoxy uh, while the epoxy was, uh, was drying. Uh, and was still sticky, well I used uh, green stuff afterwards. It worked pretty well to do what I wanted, all the details. So here you can see me using green stuff to enhance the volume of the lips. Of course it didn't show it, but I also uh, painted up uh, these um, these details. So there you go, pretty good. So here you can see me having another idea for the hairs. I folded an aluminum sheet and many times to have a thicker sheet and stick them with glue. So the, the idea was to use uh, some, some aluminum straps uh, to make the different locks of hairs that were going to be flexible enough for me to animate uh, the hairs of the character. And I started uh, gluing these uh, on the straps. I also did these dynamic eyebrows with uh, a magnet embedded in the skull. And then I protected the eyes under some paste and actually uh, repainted everything all together, both uh, the head. So I varnished it and also painted the different uh, swappable mouths. So painted the inside, uh, the teeth, uh, and then the final steps, as I wasn't going anywhere with the head, I decided to put on rapidly uh, just some kind of uh, fur hat on top of your arm for now. I mean, he's gonna have proper hairs, uh, proper haircut afterwards, but for now I just decided to put um, sort of, uh, you know, a fur uh, cap on him. So I use actual reindeer fur for this. And I'm gonna do a band that's gonna be wrapped around his head. I just mainly use some glue to do this. Also use the same wool I used before for the clothing to do this top part. This was done pretty fast and pretty badly. I just want something temporary. But I gotta find a new way of doing the, the head, the headwear. So there you go. And I'm gonna be adding a few uh, locks of hair. Uh, just sticking out, giving the impression he's actually got some some hair under the the cap. So as you can see, he still uh, hasn't got any uh, neck. I still have to do this, but to hide it in the meanwhile, I'm just gonna use a scarf. So there you go. Here you can see a few of uh, my animations. I did uh, do doing stop motion. Character works pretty well. Uh, you can also see I used a rig that I built up with my father using us uh, old components of, uh, of you know old uh, old tools and a flexible uh, arm that is made out of uh, copper very thick copper wire uh, with a magnet on the front so we've glued on a, a magnet on the character under the clothes of the character on his back just to make sure it was going to be able to be to hold in thin air if I wanted. Of course the rig or the separation you can see on screen uh, between the mouth and uh, and the rest of the face is something I gonna remove in post prod. But I'm not entirely convinced by this system. Uh, I haven't been precise enough and it's gonna ask for way too much work in animation to remove uh, each mouth at a time if the character is speaking. So I'm gonna keep this system 
uh, when the character is animated. But in case of dialogues, I'm actually gonna, you know, I'm probably gonna take pictures of these mouths and add them uh, during dialogue directly, uh, you know, in post production uh, on computer. It's gonna be way easier for me to animate dialogue. Okay, guys, I hope this video was interesting. If you haven't already, uh, like, share, subscribe. Uh, I'll probably give more content in under two months. Uh, I can pretty much uh, assure you this. It will probably be around miniature painting or stop motion, uh, either animating directly, like animation tryouts, or making uh, terrain, especially for, uh, for uh, stop motion setup. Um, so the scan is not going to be the same that it was before, but uh, techniques can definitely be uh, you know used for uh, for twenty millimeter or you know tabletop uh, gaming experience. In any case, I'm going to be experimenting with this, uh, and hopefully you have a lot of fun doing it. Uh, you guys take care and see you around. On later, signing off. Hello, my name is Bjorn, and now I can talk. Thanks for watching.